we sing that song about <clears throat> how wonderful and marvelous Jesus Christ's love is for us. And here in corporate worship, we don't just want to sing about him as if he's not here. We want to sing with him and experiencing him as he's here with us. And as we're about to open up his word, we don't just want to read about him. We want to experience him and we want him to indwell us and change us right here, right now on the spot. We want him to be with us. Let's ask for that in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, as, as the word of Christ is taught, may the people of Christ be helped by the very presence of Christ. As the word of Christ is opened, may the hearts of your people be opened by the spirit of Christ. As the word of Christ is is preached may it produce Christ likeness in us right here right now as Christ's word is explained may Christ himself be exalted be with us and bless us for your own name's sake amen the question is who is your priest who is your priest who brings you peace forgiveness the presence of God the book of Hebrews answers that question who is your priest look with me at the book of Hebrews we're going to look at verses 1 through 10 in Hebrews chapter 5 today the the beginning of this passage is the very end of Hebrews chapter 4 Beginning in verse 14, it says, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins just as he does for those of the people and no one takes this honor for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This passage is about the role of the priest. And if you see right there in verse 1 of Hebrews 5, that summarizes it. Verse 1 of Hebrews 5 says, A priest is appointed as a go-between, to act in relation, to act in transference, to act as a go-between, God and men, God and people. A holy, sinless God and sinful, needy people. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. The subject of the priest is all over this passage. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 says we have a great high priest. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us. And then in Hebrews 5 verse 1 it says every high priest has that position of go-between, between God and man. 
And then the word priest doesn't show up, but the pronoun he or him shows up in verse 2, verse 3, and verse 4, and every time that pronoun he or him is dealing with the priest. He can deal gently, he is obligated to offer sacrifices, and he didn't take this honor on himself, but God called him to it. And then in verse 5, we're back to seeing the very word priest. Christ was appointed the high priest. And in verse 6, that he's a high priest like Melchizedek. And then again, we see the word priest in verse 10, be designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews is all about the role of our great high priest. And what I want to do this morning, and actually a a brief sermon as we prepare to come to this table, is in, in one brief Bible lesson, I want to show you how the book of Hebrews snaps together and even how the Old Testament and the New Testament cohere in this subject of the priest. Hebrews is all about the priest, but it's not explaining the doctrine of the priest as a dissertation up on a shelf. As soon as we begin to talk about priests, Sometimes it seems a little removed and a little religious and a little sort of out there. But the book of Hebrews talks about the role of the priest for the purpose of a rope of rescue to people who are drifting back into their sins, people who are drifting back into unbelief. And this very doctrine of our great high priest is a rope of rescue to keep you from drifting away. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of discouraged people. I don't know if like you, they dressed up and came to church and put on a smile, even though they were discouraged in their heart. But these people were discouraged and they were being tempted to drift away from Christianity. And so the message of Hebrews is hold fast, hold on, don't let go. And the the rope that you hold on to, the one that you hold on to, the reason you don't drift is because you have this kind of high priest. In other words, the doctrine of the priesthood of Jesus Christ is the main incentive for perseverance. The doctrine of the priesthood of Jesus Christ is the main incentive for perseverance. It says here in our text that because he is such a great high priest, he has secured eternal salvation for those who obey him. The doctrine of the kind of priest Jesus is, is our incentive to hold on eternally. It's the main incentive, the chief enticement for Christians to hold on and hold fast is because Jesus is this good and this great. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of weak, feeble, tempted Christians That's why they are just like you. You're tempted. And you are weak in your own spirit and soul. The book of Hebrews was written to a weak, tempted group of Christians. Telling them, encouraging them to hold on because Jesus is strong enough to save them and sympathetic enough to love them. And we see the strength of Jesus and the sympathy of Jesus specifically here in his role as high priest. You are being tempted to sin and disobey Jesus. And the book of Hebrews says when you're tempted to sin and disobey Jesus, remember what a high priest he is and how he has paid the price by his own blood for all of your sins. So don't do it, don't sin. Not only are you being tempted to sin and disobey Jesus, you're being tempted to give up and disown Jesus. You're being tempted to shame. You're being tempted to give up and disown Jesus, tempted to be ashamed of him. And when you're tempted to be ashamed of him, the book of Hebrews says, remember what a wonderful high priest he is. Why would you be ashamed of him? So I want to show you how this fits together here in the book of Hebrews and then even how it fits together in the whole Old Testament and how it snaps together with the New Testament. This section is is very uh, unique because uh, we go from Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 to our text today, 5, 1 through 10. And I've been preaching on Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16 for about the last, I don't know, literally like the last 
four weeks. It probably feels like the last four years, like Bill Clinton was, Pat, was president when I started preaching on Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. But it's actually just been three or four weeks. But the funny thing about it is that the Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 is the conclusion to Hebrews 5, verses 1 through 10. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 has two concluding points of application. It says, let us, in verse 14, and then it says, let us, in verse 16. It says, in verse 14, it says, let us hold fast. And then in verse 16, it says, let us then with confidence draw near. It says, you have to do these two things, hold fast and draw near. And that's the therefore, that's the conclusion of the sermon. And then the sermon comes in verses 1 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 5. When you're in ABF here at church or even when you're here and listening to the sermon, usually the way we do it is we say, this is what the Bible says. We interpret it and explain it and apply it. And then somewhere along the way toward the end, I mean, we interpret it and explain it. And then some way toward the end, we apply it. We say, therefore, so what? The therefore and the so what is Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. And then the explanation and the teaching is chapter 5, 1 through 10. And this also fits with the whole structure of the epistle to the Hebrews. The theme of Jesus as the great high priest is the theme of the book of Hebrews. It's the central argument in chapter 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. All those, the the meaty middle portion of the book of Hebrews, this is the subject. Jesus Christ as great high priest. We could summarize it as uh, 5, 6, and 7. Chapters 5, 6, and 7 is the son's appointment as high priest. And that's the quotation here from Psalm 2 and from Psalm 110 in our very passage. The son's appointment as high priest. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. The son's appointment as high priest. And then chapters 8, 9, and 10. The son's perfect offering in heaven as high priest. The son's perfect offering in heaven as high priest. He was appointed a high priest and then he made a perfect sacrifice and he brought that perfect offering to heaven. Chapters 8, 9, and 10. And the middle, actually just flip ahead to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. This is an interesting verse. I hope you like this verse. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. It's a very like bumper sticker, summary, Twitter size, like this is the point, get it. Very short. See chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest one who's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. The the center of the book of Hebrews is chapters 5 through 10. And 5, 6, and 7 are about the appointment of Christ as high priest. And 8, 9, and 10 are about his perfect offering in heaven as high priest. And 8, 1 is the swing hinge right in the center of this argument. But you see even more so how the, remember I said 4, 14 to 16 is the therefore and the conclusion? And then we have another therefore and conclusion. Turn ahead to chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Turn ahead to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. This sounds, Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25, sounds a lot like Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. In other words, these are the brackets. Hebrews 10 verse 19 says, therefore, this is the conclusion. We had a conclusion before it started. Now we have a conclusion when it ends. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, verse 22, you recognize that? Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Look at verse 23 of chapter 10. You recognize that? Let us hold fast. You see that? Verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. 4, 14 to 16. Let us hold fast and let us draw near. 
10, 19 through 23, let us hold fast and let us draw near. And those concluding calls to action at the beginning and the end of this great section in this epistle that explains what kind of high priest Jesus is. This explanation of Jesus as high priest is not an irrelevant doctrinal speculation. This explanation of Jesus as high priest is the foundational, is the foundation of the exhortation to you when I as a pastor keep telling you, you have to make it to the end. Don't drift away into sin. Don't let go of your confession of Jesus Christ. You have to make it all the way to the end. Don't drift, draw near. So today, I don't even really want to explain verses 1 through 10 of Hebrews chapter 5. Lord willing, we'll do that next week. And then, actually the week after that, Lord willing, I will be preaching from a pulpit in Cabernet Bulcaria. And I don't know if I should tell you who will be preaching here. I'll just give you a hint. The person in this pulpit is will be Calvin Miller's favorite pastor. That's your hint. And then um, the week after that, Marquis Laughlin will be here, Lord willing. And the week after that, we'll pick this back up. But next week, I want to go through the exegetical and interpretive details of verses 1 through 10. This week, I just want to place this concept of the priest in the, in the scope of the Bible. So to do that, I want to go back. Let's go back to the book of Job. The Old Testament goes Job and then Psalms. Go back to Job, chapter 9. I send you back to Job. We'll go to Exodus next, Lord willing. But I think um, I send you back to Job because Job is just about the oldest book in the Bible. The events that are recorded in Genesis 1 and 2, obviously, are the, are the, the creation of the world. But the the setting of the book of Job is way, way, way back in the earliest days of the patriarchs. And here in this oldest, one of the oldest books in the Bible, we have the, the oldest primal longing, the oldest human craving of the heart. Look at the, the pathos with which this poetry is presented in Job chapter 9. Job is saying, I am struggling down here. And God seems so high and mighty up there. And I'm struggling down here. Job chapter 9. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know that it is so. How can a man be in the right before God? If one, wished, if one wished to contend with God, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against God and succeeded? I know the answer to that question, do you? He who removes mountains and they know it not, when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble? Who commands the sun and it does not rise? Who seals up the stars? Who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea? He's saying, I'm struggling down here, but God is so high and so powerful up there. And look at the end of the chapter. Look at verse 25 of Job 9. Look at verse 25. My days are swifter then a runner, they flee away and they see no good. They go by like skiffs of reed, like an eagle swooping on the prey. If I say, I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and be of good cheer. I become afraid of all my suffering, for I know you will not hold me innocent. I shall be condemned. Why then do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow and cleanse my hands with lye, yet you will plunge me into the pit and my own clothes will abhor me. Verse 32, for he, for God, is not a man as I am, that I might answer him. Look at the second half of verse 32, that we should come to trial. Or you could say that we should come to conversation together. 
There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 says every priest that is appointed among men is appointed for men to bring them to God as an arbiter. And here in one of the oldest books of the Bible, we have this primal longing of the human heart in verse 33 saying, there doesn't seem to be an arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. God is so high and holy. I am so low and needy. I know I can't answer back to him. I know I can't even converse with him. What can I do? I want someone to bridge that gap for me. I know I can't bridge it myself. I need someone to bridge it for me. And he says what he needs. You see verse 32? God's not a man as I am that I can come together with him. And so he knows what he needs. He needs a priest who is like him. That's why Hebrews chapter 5 says the high priest is appointed from among men because as a man he can be sympathetic to humans. That's why it's said in verse 2 and verse 8, he himself has suffered. So he knows what it's like to suffer. So he's appointed from men, but he has to be able to appear before God. How can a man appear before God? I hope you already see how the Bible fits together. I hope you already see. I hope like I do, you love, 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 are crazy about finding Jesus in the pages of the Old Testament. Every line whispers his name. This is a symphony and every note in the symphony comes back to this most beautiful motif of the name of Jesus Christ. Every stream is a little tributary that contributes to the mighty rushing river that is Jesus, son of God, son of man, bloody, slain, shamed, crucified, risen, triumphant, returning, victorious, glorious. Every line in this great drama leads to the one central hero, Jesus, our Savior. And from the book of Job, flip back to the book of Exodus. Flip to Exodus chapter 28. These are the instructions for the appointment of the priest. Flip back to Exodus chapter 28. These are the instructions for the appointment of the high priest. Exodus 28. Then bring near to you Aaron your brother and his sons with him. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breast piece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, a sash. You're saying, this is about the priest and, and now he's going into so much detail about what he has to wear. Why? Why? It'll become evident. They shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons to serve as priests. Verse 5, they shall receive gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple, and scarlet yarns, and of fine twined linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its edges so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be like it and be of one piece with of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. You see that in verse 9? Six of their names on the one stone and the names of the remaining six on the other stone in the order of their birth. 
As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in the settings of gold filigree. And you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. I hope you see why we have all of this detail about what kind of thread, what kind of metal, what kind of jewel, all of this detail about what the priest wears. The reason why there's all this detail about what the priest wears is because what the priest wears is the names of the people whom he is representing. We, I mean, we won't read all the rest of it, but it keeps coming up. There in, uh, in the same chapter in verse, um, in verse 21, there shall be 12 stones with their names engraved according to the sons of Israel. It comes up again there in verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastplate of, in the breast piece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. You need a priest to bear your name before the Lord. Because, because you cannot appear before God in your own robes and in your own name. I was just talking to somebody not, not two, three weeks ago who was feeling guilty and she said something like, I... I I know God has forgiven me. I just need to learn to forgive myself. And I said, what did you say? <laughs> we, we, our problem is not that we have to somehow forgive ourselves. You can look yourself in the mirror all day and say, self, I forgive you. It, it, it doesn't matter. You're not the authoritative standard against whom you have sinned. You can't bear, your, it doesn't matter that you bear your own name to yourself. How does your name appear before God? This is, this is what we need. We need God to forgive us. The self that looks back at you from the mirror can't, can't, can't forgive you, even if the self that looks back at you from the mirror wants to and loves you. It, it doesn't matter because we've sinned against God and he's the one that has to grant us forgiveness. And so he keeps saying, the priest bears the names, the priest bears the names before God. And from Exodus, let's go one more place to Leviticus. Awesome book, Leviticus. Let's go to Leviticus chapter one. The book of Leviticus is, is phenomenally relevant to your life today when we talk about priests and sacrifices and Leviticus and and the ephod and the it seems like it seems removed but I this is just a tiny kind of behind the scenes one of one of the most important unasked questions in a church isn't um how do we make the preaching and the ministry relevant? People ask all the time, how do we make our ministries relevant so they connect with people? How do we make our preaching relevant so it connects with people? We ask that question out loud all the time. To my way of thinking about spiritual leadership and direction and vision, the most important question that doesn't get asked is, who decides what is relevant? That's the issue. Who decides what's relevant? Because relevance is relative to what you think you need. And if part of your problem is you're convinced that you need things that you don't need, then the things that seem relevant to you are just going to hurt you and weigh you down more and more. Because your problem is you don't even know what's relevant because you don't even see your true needs. It's our conviction at RBC that our ministries have to be relevant and our preaching has to be relevant. And it is our conviction at Racine Bible Church that the Bible and God alone defines and determines what is relevant. Since the gospel shows us our real need, 
the book of Leviticus is just right dead center relevant for every middle schooler, every member of Racine Bible Church. Absolutely. The book of Leviticus says in chapter 1, verse 1, The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. Verse 4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. And it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He shall lay his hand on the head of the offering. That's what it says in Leviticus 1 verse 4. Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3, Leviticus 4 and 5 have this same phrase. He shall lay his head on the hand of the offering. This phrase is repeated over and over in the book of Leviticus. He'll lay his hand on the head of the lamb or on the head of the bull. In my house yesterday, just in sermon preparation, I called my dog over. I like my dog. I'm not sure I love my dog, but I like him. And uh, I called him over. And when he comes over, he instinctively and immediately just nuzzles his head up into my hand. I don't have to be like, sit still so I can put my hand on your head. He likes to have his head right there because he wants me to scratch his ears. And he just, you know, and I, and I felt his head and it felt warm. And he just looks up at me with those sort of grateful eyes because he doesn't know how to go to Sam's Club and buy dog food and I do so he just he (laughs) admires me so much book of Leviticus says you lay your hand on the head of the animal then the next verse says the priest slits the animal's throat and just wings that blood all over the altar John Murray, in his little book, Redemption Accomplished and Applies, Applied, says um, this laying your hand on the head of the animal is the pivot, the pivot on which the Old Testament turns. Listen to how he says it. Sin, this is simple, sin involves a certain liability, a liability arising from the holiness of God. Sacrifice for sin is the divinely instituted provision whereby the sin might be covered and the liability to the divine wrath might be taken away. In laying his hand on the head of the offering, there was transferred symbolically to the offering for sin the liability of the offerer. This is the pivot on which the transaction of redemption turns. The notion in essence is that the sin of the offerer was being imputed to the offering and the offering bore in substantive endurance the death penalty for that sin. This is the pivot on which the whole thing turns. I've sinned and I deserve to die, but if I lay my hand on that offering that God has provided, then all of my sin can be transferred to that offering. And then immediately after I lay my head on the hand on the head of that offering, the priest cuts the throat and spreads the blood everywhere. And what I see is that's what my sin deserved. But I put my other hand here and I feel that my heart is still beating. I'm not dead yet. I'm still alive. And the reason I'm alive is not because I have obeyed God and and merited righteousness. The reason I'm alive is because God, oh mercy, mercy and grace, God has said I will take that in your place. This is the pivot on which the whole thing turns. We're going to sing 
in just a moment as the elements are passed, how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. The wretch places the hand on the head. The beautiful, glorious, spotless son of God is the lamb upon whose head the wretch places his hand. This is the love of God. God in the gospel. Nothing less. Nothing less. Isaac Watts snapped the Old Testament together with the book of Hebrews. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. My faith would lay her hand on that dear head of thine while like a penitent I stand and there confess my sin. Believing we rejoice to see the curse remove, we bless the lamb with cheerful voice and sing his bleeding love. This is the pivot on which the whole thing turns. Who is your priest? Who is your priest? We have a Catholic friend in our neighborhood and she said to me once, she said something negative about her priest. I can't actually repeat what she said into this microphone because it's uh, not safe for work words were used in what she said. She was just saying how she was, her priest was no good. Who is your priest? Is your priest any good? Who is your priest? If you have a Catholic friend and they say, what do you go to Racine Bible Church? Do you, do you guys even have priests there? You, do, you, do you have a priest? I'll tell you what you say. We do have a priest. Tell them, we do have a priest. Say, we have pastors, and our pastors are so-so. You know, we have two pastors who are really tall. They're great. We have a pastor who plays the piano. We have a pastor who works with the youth. We have a, a retired CFO who's kind of a pastor of administration and helps with our elder board. Our pastors are, are, are decent. But we have a priest. And can I just tell you, friend, that our love and our respect for our priest outshines and outmatches our love and respect for our pastors a thousand, ten thousand, a million to one. Because our priest has brought our souls to God. And our priest sympathizes with us and he always knows what we need and he always provides what we need. This is our priest. He's Jesus and he is everything. Let's pray. Oh Lord Jesus, our great high priest, as your word is opened, open our hearts. As your name is spoken by our lips, bear our names before the throne of God above. Let us see the power of the cross. Let us see the son of God slain for us. Let us lay our hand on that head and there believe and know your perfect love. Amen.
Jesus, we rejoice in the forgiveness of all of our sins, and we praise you, Lord Jesus, for what you have done for us. Amen. Amen. I invite the congregation to stand for the benediction. The word of benediction is just something to think about as we come to this table. The word of benediction is that in Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, when he took the Last Supper with his disciples, one of the things that he repeated to them three times in Luke 22 is that he said, I'm coming back and I'm going to eat and drink with you in the kingdom of God. He's coming and we'll eat and drink with him. Amen.